Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Forbidden Archaeology, or as I sometimes call it, Paleolithomania. <laughs> now, we've heard something today about megaliths. Megalith is a word, it means big stones used in structures. And I was very fortunate last night to be able to go out to Stonehenge and visit the classic megalithic structure here. I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And although my main focus of research is not megaliths, sometimes in my travels around the world, I do see some megalithic structures. For example, last year I was in India at a place called Humpy in uh, west central India, and I just happened to notice this megalithic structure sitting on a hill next to a boulder perched in a very interesting position. I don't know what it means or what it's for or how old it is, but it is a megalithic structure that I've seen. Also, uh, a couple of years ago, I was speaking at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress in Osaka, Japan, and I visited the Osaka castle there, and some of the interior walls of the castle have some megaliths as part of them. This, this one is 48 square meters, weighs 108 tons, and this wall is full of stones such, of such size and weight from, taken from distant places. So I have seen some megaliths, but it's not what I'm speaking about tonight. Tonight I'm going to be talking about Paleoliths, <clears throat> and that means old stones. <laughs> Not those old stones who I dearly love, but other types of stones, old flint objects, and also human bones, human footprints, and very ancient layers of stone. And the question that I'm really looking at is how old is the human species? Some researchers are looking into how old are different civilizations. I'm looking at the age of our human species on this planet. So how old is our species? Today, the most common answer to that question comes from the modern followers of Charles Darwin and they tell us that the first human beings like us appeared about 150,000 years ago. Uh, before that, uh, they tell us there were no human beings like us. There were only more primitive ape-like human ancestors. However, the writings of different ancient wisdom traditions, such as the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, tell us a different story. They tell us humans have existed on Earth for many millions of years, going all the way back to the very beginnings of life on Earth. And there is some evidence for this. It's not simply mythology. And I've documented this evidence in these books, some copies of which are here today. This evidence is not very well known because of what I call a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. We can call the blue box the knowledge filter. What it represents is the dominant consensus in the scientific community about a particular question, in this case, human antiquity. And reports of evidence that support the dominant consensus will pass through this filter very easily, which means, for example, that students will read about this evidence in their textbooks. 
But if we have reports of evidence that radically contradict the dominant theories, this evidence tends to be filtered out, forgotten, set aside, dismissed for unfair reasons. And therefore, most people, even in the professional scientific community, are unaware of this evidence, which contradicts the ideas being promoted by the modern followers of Charles Darwin. Now, I've spoken about this evidence in some unusual places. <clears throat> For example, the Royal Institution in London. Uh, many of you who are a little bit older will recall that the backside of the old 20-pound note shows the Royal Institution Lecture Hall with Michael Faraday, the physicist Michael Faraday, speaking there about 150 years ago. One thing I really love about England is how much the English people love their traditions. <clears throat> you know, the same table is there in the Royal Institution that was there 150 years ago where Michael Faraday was speaking. 150 years later, Michael Cremo speaking at the same same table, and some of the same people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't speak only at these scientific institutions and universities. This is me speaking at an eco camp in Alto Paraiso, Brazil. <clears throat> and I enjoy speaking to all kinds of gatherings, but not everyone appreciates what I have to say. Uh, this was uh, a little bit of a discussion after my lecture at uh, the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. One of the evolutionary biologists there uh, took exception to some of the things I was saying. But now I'm gonna go over some of the kind of evidence that I'm talking about, that I document in my books. This is a geologist, Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre. She was involved in dating an archeological site in Mexico at a place called Huayatlaco. It's near the town of Puebla in central Mexico. And there, archaeologists discovered human artifacts. This is the excavation at Huayatlaco. It was a very professional excavation. The artifacts were photographed in the layers of rock in which they were found. And of course, the archaeologists wanted to know how old these things were. So they called a team of geologists to date the site. Virginia Steen McIntyre and her colleagues used four methods to date the site. And they concluded that the site must be at least 250,000 years old. But the archaeologists said that's impossible. According to their theories, human beings capable of making the artifacts did not exist anywhere in the world 250,000 years ago. So they refused to publish the age for the site given by their own hand-picked team of geologists. So Virginia Steen McIntyre and her colleagues were a little upset by that. So they independently published the age for the site in a scientific journal. But when they did that, they experienced an extreme negative backlash from their colleagues in the scientific world. Virginia Steen McIntyre lost a teaching position that she held at a university in the United States, and her career as a geologist was suddenly finished because she had dared to publish something that contradicted the dominant theory. She wrote to the editor of the scientific journal that published her report, 
Not being an anthropologist, I didn't realize how deeply woven into our thought the current theory of human evolution has become. Our work at Huayatlaco has been rejected by most archaeologists because it contradicts that theory, period. Now, some more work has been done in that area in recent years. There's an archaeologist named Sylvia Gonzalez who now works at a university here in the United Kingdom. She announced the discovery of <clears throat> footprints at the Valsequillo Reservoir, which is right near Huayatlaco. Panic ash. So she used the radiocarbon method to date the layers of ash and got an age of 41,500 years, which is old for North America. Generally, scientists think there were no human beings in North America until about 20,000 years ago maximum. But it's well within the range of the anatomically modern human species. As I said in the beginning, most scientists today would say uh, the, the humans like ourselves came into existence 150,000 years ago. So 41,000 years is not outside that range. However, another scientist from the United States went down there and did additional stating, dating studies on the layer of volcanic ash containing the footprints. He used a different method, a method that he regarded as more accurate. And he got an age of 1.3 million years for those layers of ash. Now, here's what his conclusion was. His conclusion was those prints cannot possibly be human footprints because human beings didn't exist 1,300,000 years ago. My conclusion is a little bit different. The impressions are human footprints showing that humans like us existed 1.3 million years ago. The footprints are human footprints. They're found in layers of rock 1,300,000 years old. That's evidence for an ancient human presence. And there are other discoveries, if we look into the history of archaeology, that support that idea from the same part of the world. In the early 20th century, a human skull, skull cap, it's a partial skull, just the top part of it, was found in Buenos Aires. It was found in an excavation there. The uh, excavators had gone down about 15 meters. At that level, they encountered a thick layer of limestone rock, locally named by, the, uh, co locally called Tosca. And when they broke through that layer of limestone rock, they found the human skull. Now, according to modern geologists, that layer beneath the Tosca at that place belongs to the pre ensenadan formation. And according to modern geologists, that formation is at least one and a half million years old. So there's human skeletal remains over a million years old. There are human footprints over a million years old. This discovery from Buenos Aires was announced to the scientific world by a prominent South American paleontologist, Florentino Ameghino. Now here in England, an interesting discovery was announced at a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in 1881 by the geologist Henry Stopes. He announced the discovery of a shell with a simple but recognizable human face carved on it. This shell came from 
the Red Crag Formation at Walton on Nays, which is on uh, the North Sea coast in East Anglia, uh, as you see here on this map. This is a photograph of the shore at Walton on Nays, and uh, the Red Crag Formation can be seen high up on the cliff there. It's that reddish uh, band. Uh, just a, a little bit from the top of the cliff there. And it is that formation that contains fossil seashells, including the fossil seashell with the human face carved upon it. Now, how old is that red crag formation? Modern geologists here in the United Kingdom tell us that the Red Crag Formation belongs to the geological period called the Pliocene, belongs to the late Pliocene, which would make it between two and three million years old. Another interesting discovery was made in the same general area. A human jawbone was discovered 16 feet deep in the Red Crag Formation at a place called Foxhall. So Foxhall is on the eastern outskirts of Ipswich, also in East Anglia, not very far from Walton on Nays. And there we have a human jawbone found in the same formation two to three million years old. Later, in the early 20th century, a researcher named J. Reed Moore of the Prehistoric Society of East Anglia went to Foxhall and conducted additional excavations in which he discovered many stone tools and weapons along with signs of the use of fire. He found fireplaces. So this caused Henry Fairfield Osborne, a prominent American archeologist to say, the discoveries of J. Reed Moore bring indubitable evidence of the existence of man in Southeast Britain before the close of the Pliocene. Uh, the Pliocene period is the geological period that goes from between two million and five million years ago. So before that period ended, human beings were present in Britain. <clears throat> in 1979, Mary Leakey announced the discovery of footprints at a place called Laetoli in the country of Tanzania in East Africa. In her original report, Mary Leakey said, the footprints are indistinguishable from modern human footprints. Other scientists also agreed. Paleontologist Tim White said, make no mistake about it, they are like modern human footprints. Now the problem is, these footprints were found in layers of solidified volcanic ash 3,700,000 years old. Now, neither Mary Leakey nor Tim White believed that human beings like us made those footprints. They're evolutionists. They don't think humans like us existed almost four million years years ago. So how did they explain the footprints? Well, they proposed there must have existed some type of ape man living at that time who had feet exactly like modern human feet. Now that's an interesting proposal. However, there's no physical evidence to back that up. We have the skeletons of the ape men who existed at that time. They're called Australopithecus. And foot bones of Australopithecus have been found. And the foot structure of Australopithecus is not exactly like that of a modern human being. The foot of Australopithecus is very ape-like. It's like a kind of chimpanzee called the bonobo with very long 
uh, toes, sort of like human fingers, and especially it has a first toe, a long first toe that can move out to the side like a, a human thumb. So the only creature actually known to science today that has a foot exactly like that of a modern human being is a modern human being like ourselves. <laughs> Unless some of you have a long first toe that you can move <laughs> out to the side. <clears throat> so what did Mary Leakey actually find? I think we have to keep our minds open to the possibility she found evidence for a human presence going back almost four million years. Now, some might say, okay, footprints are a little bit ambiguous. It would be better if you had human skeletal remains four million years old, and such things do exist. This is a skull cap, an anatomically modern human skull cap that was found by the Italian geologist Giuseppe Ragazzoni in the late 19th century at a place called Castanedolo in northern Italy. It was part of a fairly complete anatomically modern human skeleton that he excavated at that place. I went to the village of Castanedolo and I met this gentleman there and he gave me a copy of a very rare geological report in Italian about this discovery. From the information in the report, we were able to relocate the place where the original excavation was made, and it should be possible to do more research there. Now, when some scientists today hear that an anatomically modern human skeleton has been found in layers of rock four million years old, they say, okay, this is very easy to explain. Maybe 4,000 years ago, someone died on the surface, his friends dug a grave, and they put the body down into that ancient layer of rock, and then they filled it in, and that's why you think you've found a human skeleton four million years old. Now things like this can happen. Technically, it's called intrusive burial, but Ragazzoni, Dr. Ragazzoni was a professional geologist and he was very much aware of this problem. And in his original report, he points out that if it had been a burial, then the layers of rock above the skeleton would have been disturbed, as we see in this diagram here. But he said he looked very carefully when he was taking the skeleton out of the ground, and he could see that all the layers of rock above the skeleton were intact and undisturbed. Actually, he said each layer above the skeleton had its own microstratification which was undisturbed. So that means the skeleton really does belong in the layer in which it was found, in this case, about four million years old. We'll take a further step back in time. This is the Portuguese geologist, Carlos Ribeiro. He was head of the government geology department in the latter part of the 19th century he discovered hundreds of human artifacts in his country of Portugal in layers of rock 20 million years old. And as a professional geologist, he said, no, they did not slip down into those ancient layers through some fissure or crack or earth movement. I'm a professional geologist. I can see they are native to the layers of rock in which they were found. He displayed these artifacts in the glass cases you see there in the Museum of Geology in Lisbon. So when I was investigating this case, I went to this museum, but the artifacts are not displayed in those glass cases anymore. Uh, today they're kept locked in the little cabinets down uh, behind me. But I got permission from the director of the museum to open up 
those cabinets, and I was able to study and photograph some of these 20 million year old human artifacts from Portugal. And I also studied Dr. Ribeiro's original maps and field notes in the museum archives. After that, I went into the countryside of Portugal and I relocated some of the sites where Ribeiro made his discoveries. For example, this is the quarry at Muganera, where he found human artifacts in layers of rock 20 million years old, including this flint artifact with a point on it. Down at the point, there are use marks showing it was used. It's interesting what happened. When Ribeiro was alive, he displayed these artifacts in the museum in Lisbon with labels indicating an age of 20 million years. After he died, his colleagues in the museum did something interesting. They left the artifacts on display, but they wrote new labels for them, giving them far younger ages. This is the new label that they wrote for the artifact I just showed you. The second line gives the age. It says Paleolithico Superior. That means upper Paleolithic period. And according to archaeologists today, that period in Europe goes back about 20,000 years. So, you know, Ribeiro's colleagues thought, well, 20 million years, that's clearly impossible. 20,000 years, that sounds about right. So they wrote new labels for all of the artifacts. And then the next generation of officials in the museum just put the entire collection away, new labels and all. And I'm the first researcher to see these things in over 50 years. Now here's a case I've been looking into recently. I've got it under study. Um, somebody can help me pronounce this name. Herbert Basedal, Basedal, anybody know? Okay, Herbert Basedal, I'll call him. He was conducting some excavations of Aboriginal rock art in Australia early in the 20th century. And he was working at a place called uh, Lake Eyre, and he was looking at rock art there. And the, the thing that I found interesting was this. Now, the specific type of rock art that we're looking at is called pecked rock art. In other words, the aboriginal artists were using a piece of stone to chip out little pecks of rock to make a pattern. And can anybody tell me what that pattern is, or what it suggests to you? It's actually a platypus. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not the best with this digital tracing equipment, but it's, uh, you can see at the top there, there's the platypus bill, and then there's four legs. And actually, if you look really closely, you can see the claws. I, I wasn't able to get that in, you know, down at the bottom, especially on both sides. And it's really a special kind of platypus that's no longer living. It's a, that, it's a, it's a fairly big one, and it's now extinct. But in any case, <clears throat> in any case, uh, this place... Lake Air is in, let's see if I can get this to work. There's Lake Air there. It's actually in the south central part of Australia. And it's a very dry area. No platypuses there now. And this map shows the current range the yellow area is the current range of the platypus, and Lake Air is way off the current range in this extremely dry area. So I had a question that I put to the platypus experts at the Australian National Museum in Sydney. 
So I asked them, what is the latest date the platypus could have lived in the Lake Eyre region? And they said, well, they may have lived there 20 to 25 million years ago or may well have lasted up to about 10 or 15 million years ago. So <clears throat> just to show you how my twisted mind works, <laughs> okay, you've got rock art showing a platypus. Not a living type of platypus, but an extinct type of platypus. No platypus is living there now. And according to the platypus experts among the scientists in Australia, no platypus has been there for 15 million years, 10 or 15 million years. So the way my mind works is, well, 10 or 15 million years ago, when there was a platypus there, somebody made this rock art depicting it. Hence, evidence for a human presence 10 to 15 million years ago in Australia. That's how my mind works. Now, amber is a pretty interesting substance. <clears throat> uh, some amber is found in the Baltic area, like the seashore of Latvia, for example. And sometimes in amber, scientists find very interesting things. Of course, it's the fossilized sap of a tree. And sometimes in amber, scientists find insects, millions of years old, fossil insects. So a few years ago, I was giving some lectures in Russia. <clears throat> My books are published in the Russian language, and I've been invited there many times to give lectures. So in St. Petersburg, I'd given a lecture, and after the lecture, a Russian naval officer, retired now, came up to me and showed me a piece of amber that he had found on the seacoast of Latvia uh, during his time there, uh, during the Soviet period, when he was a naval officer stationed at a base in Latvia. And this is the piece of amber he showed me. And the interesting part is up here. <clears throat> Are you starting to see something there? Like a little uh, woven type structure. <clears throat> now, this is inside that piece of amber. You can see it there. <clears throat> now, this is really kind of interesting to me because according to standard histories, weaving of cloth, that type of weaving only began about 15,000 years ago in the Neolithic period. That's the standard scientific idea. However, the amber from the Baltic is from the geological period called the Oligocene. And the Oligocene goes from 25 million to 38 million years ago. So this is the way my mind works. <laughs> Uh, I take this as possible evidence for a human presence at least 25 million years ago. Now, a case that I've often spoken about before, but which remains one of my favorites, just like at a Rolling Stones concert, you know, still going to hear satisfaction. <laughs> even after 40 years. So probably if I keep lecturing for another 40 years, you're going to hear this case again. Uh, it's the California gold mine discoveries. Gold was discovered in the 19th century in California. To get the gold, miners dug tunnels into the sides of mountains at places like Table Mountain in California. 
And deep inside the tunnels and the solid rock, the miners found human bones and human artifacts. For example, they found many of these stone mortars and pestles. Now what makes these discoveries so interesting to me is that they were found in layers of solid rock that belong to the early part of the geological period called the Eocene, which means they'd be about 50 million years old. These discoveries were announced to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. His report was published by Harvard University in the year 1880. But we do not read about these things in the textbooks today because of the process of knowledge filtration. And this is the scientist most responsible for the knowledge filtering in this particular case. William Holmes, an anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. He wrote, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution, he would not have published that report despite the imposing array of testimony with which he was confronted. <laughs> I'll translate that for you who don't understand scientees. If the facts don't fit the theory, the facts have to be wrong. <clears throat> and they should be forgotten. And that's exactly what happened. However, a few years ago, I was a consultant for a television documentary called The Mysterious Origins of Man uh, that was shown on NBC, one of the largest American television networks. The producer, a man named Bill Cote, had read my book, Forbidden Archaeology, and he wanted to include some cases from the book in the documentary. So I told him he should go to the to the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley because I knew that some of the artifacts from the California gold mines are still in the collection of that museum. So he went there, but the museum officials refused to allow him to see the artifacts, what to speak of film them. Now we were able to find some photographs of the artifacts that Dr. Whitney had taken in the 19th century. So he did have some images to use in the documentary. But it was interesting what happened. Uh, this documentary featured not just my work, but the work of other researchers in the alternative history field, like Graham Hancock and others. When scientists in the United States found out that NBC was going to show this television program, on a Sunday evening at a time when many innocent young children <laughs> would still be up watching the telly with their parents. They went ballistic. They tried to stop NBC from showing the program. They weren't successful. It was shown. It was quite popular. So then this group of scientists went to the United States government, to the Federal Communications Commission, which is the agency of the government that regulates the TV broadcasting industry. And they tried to get the government to investigate NBC, censure NBC. But they wanted the government to force NBC to broadcast primetime apologies for having shown the program and they also wanted the government to fine NBC millions of dollars so they would never do any such thing again. Now, I'm happy to say the government didn't do any of those things, but I thought it was very interesting that these organized attempts to do this were made by the scientific community. Now, later, I went back to the museum myself. I was preparing to give a report about these discoveries at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress, of which I'm a member, and which is the world's largest international organization of archaeologists. So my proposal to pre present such a report was accepted by the Congress. So I went to the museum of officials with the letter of acceptance, and they decided they would let me personally see these artifacts. They're not kept in the museum 
itself. They're kept in a storage building several miles from the museum. And I had to be accompanied by a museum official every step of the way, go through all kinds of security. And these are some of the artifacts from the California gold mines. Now, if you went to the museum, you would never see them. I mean, sometimes people think this idea that there are strange things in the storerooms of the museums, <clears throat> that's just Hollywood movie material, like from Indiana Jones and films like that. But it actually is a fact, you know, as we heard from Brian a little earlier today, and now from me, there are some pretty strange things in the storerooms of the museum that the general public don't get to see. I also studied Dr. Whitney's original maps and field notes, and then I went into the mountains of California. This is Table Mountain as it looks today. And we were able to find some of the old gold mining tunnels where these objects were originally discovered. Now, how far back in time can we go with evidence like this? In the year 1862, a scientific journal called The Geologist published an interesting report. A human skeleton was found 30 meters below the surface of the ground in Macoupin County in the state of Illinois in America. According to the report, above the skeleton was a thick layer of slate rock that was unbroken. That's an important detail. It kind of rules out the intrusive burial hypothesis. And according to modern geologists of the state of Illinois, that layer beneath the slate rock at that place is about 300 million years old. This interesting report from, <laughs> oops, got a little bit ahead of myself there. <clears throat> you saw into the future. You had a, <laughs> you had a premonition of what's coming. <clears throat> this, this interesting report from Scientific American from the year 1852 tells of a beautiful metallic vase that was found five meters deep in solid rock near the, uh, near the city of Boston in a place called Dorchester. I think there's a place like that in England, isn't there? <laughs> but this is the American Dorchester. Uh, it was a beautiful silver inlaid vase with a, some beautiful floral pattern engraved in it. And it was found five meters deep in solid rock. And according to modern geologists of the United States Geological Survey, the age of the rock at that place, at that depth, is about 600 million years. So I could keep you here from now until Christmas going through one case after another because there are hundreds of these, but we don't have time for that. But the point is, there is archaeological evidence that contradicts the idea that humans like us appeared fairly recently within the past 150,000 years on Earth. And this archaeological evidence is consistent with the writings of many ancient wisdom traditions, such as the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, which tell us humans have been present on Earth for millions and millions of years in the course of cyclical time. So I'm, I'm going to wrap this up with some stories about my experiences in presenting this type of thing at universities around the world. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, my books are now published in about 20 different languages. One of them is Russian. So I've been invited to Russia several times and I've lectured at universities from one end of the country to the other. Normally the lectures go okay, but in some cases there are problems. For example, I was invited to speak at the Tumen State University in Russia. Some professors there wanted me to speak about my work, and a lecture was scheduled. But the day before the lecture, the president of the university canceled 
the lecture because of pressure from other professors in the university who did not want me to speak. First of all, because I was contradicting uh, the theory of human evolution. And second of all, because I was doing it from the perspective of some ancient wisdom tradition. Uh, they didn't like that at all. So the professors who invited me tried to get the president of the university to change his mind, but he wouldn't. The pressure from the other side was too great. So then the professors who invited me went to the local branch of the Russian Academy of Science. And they spoke to the director there, and he said, OK, if they won't let him speak at the university, he can speak here. And nobody will put any pressure on me to cancel his lecture. So they had buses bring students and professors from the university to the Russian Academy of Science building. And the professors who invited me said, more people came than would have come <laughs> if the lecture had been held at the university. Because they were all just wondering, what is this man going to say that's so dangerous that they canceled his lecture? <clears throat> so then, after the lecture, I had a nice meeting with the director of the Russian Academy of Science branch and with some of the scientists who had, who had invited me and appreciated what I had to say. And then the next year, I went back to the same university and I spoke in the biology department there, no problem. I guess they learned their lesson. Better just let me speak. <laughs> But this happens sometimes. If, if this sort of thing didn't happen once or twice a year, I'd have to stop calling myself the forbidden archaeologist. <laughs> I think maybe I'm going soft or something. Something's wrong. So I want to thank you for your kind attention. Uh, if you want to follow up on any of these things, you could have a look at this, my latest book, The Forbidden Archaeologist, which is made of columns that I write for Atlantis Rising magazine. So they're all, it's all short, bite-sized pieces, easy to read. It's a good introduction to my work for those who aren't already familiar with it. And then some of my other books are also out there at the table in front. I'm also going to mention that in December 2012, I'm a, a speaker on a cruise that's going to the Mayan sites in Central America. I'm going to be talking about Vedic time cycles as they relate to Mayan time cycles. If you're interested in a cruise, you might think about that. And you could also follow up on my work at my website or Facebook. Twitter. Thanks a lot. Questions? Questions, anyone? There's a few. We'll wait for the mic, please. Thank you. Uh, earlier on, we uh, heard about some very elongated skulls, and those people were probably around about seven or eight feet tall. In your ex experience, have you found ordinary skulled skeletons that are taller than that? There are many reports of such things. Um, when I think of tall, I think taller than seven feet because there are many people living today who are seven feet tall. They play on the basketball teams. And there are even a few people eight feet tall today. If we talk about people 10 feet or more tall, that's what I consider to be quite big. Of course, you could find skeletons of living, recently living people today who are seven feet tall or even up to eight feet tall. 
So for me, I'm in that particular area of research, I'm most interested in reports of human skeletal remains of extremely large size, by which I mean over nine or 10 feet tall. There are many reports of such things. There are a lot of photographs that you see on the web, but in every single case uh, that I know of, it's very likely they're Photoshop jobs. There's one very famous one that circulated a lot on the web, shows uh, a large size human skeleton, maybe 30 or 40 feet long, lying in the ground, surrounded by little humans with shovels and excavating. And many people sent me that. It's still circulating on the web today, but I had a question about it. You know, when I looked at you know, the skeleton, I could see from the shadows it was making that the sun or light source was high and to the rear of the skeleton. And then there was a, a man standing behind the skull, kind of leaning over it. He should have been casting a shadow right across the skull, but he wasn't. So that sort of tipped me off to, well, that's most likely a, a, a Photoshop collage. And later it was shown that that's what indeed what it was. It was an entry into a Photoshop collage contest. And in many of the such of those cases, sometimes they're connected with descriptions of where the skeleton is. I mean, that particular one, it was identified as a skeleton from India, from Saudi Arabia, from Indonesia, from you know, a lot of different places. Or in many cases, investigators are mentioned in connection with these photographs of giant skeletons that appear on the web. And in every single case, they prove impossible to track down or contact. It's Now, I think that large size humans did exist in the past. You know, I'm rather convinced of that myself. But I would like to be able to verify a single case. At, you know, you could see from you know, my presentation that I like whenever possible to get into the muse museum collections, verify that the objects are there, if possible, photograph them and things of that sort. So in the case of these large size human bones, although there are many reports of them, I have not been able to personally verify any of them myself up to this point in time. And therefore, you know, I'm kind of holding back on publicly you know, presenting you know, these many reports until I'm actually able to verify uh, one of them and hopefully more of them. Have you been able to take any DNA samples from any of the um, bones or fossils that you found? And if so, have, have the samples matched exactly our human DNA today, or have you found any differences? No, I haven't been able to do that. Um, a lot of, of course, these things aren't under my control, so they're, I'm not able to do that. And as Brian was mentioning a little bit earlier today, when you have fossils of a certain age, the DNA starts to decay. It's an organic molecule. So even in the specimens that he's dealing with, which are a few thousand years old, it's very much decayed and it's very difficult to study, to sequence. And if we're talking about millions of years old, it's very unlikely that there would be any left to analyze. But 
that's just as far as I've gone with it. You know, if what I'm hoping to do and you know, by my work is inspire new generations of researchers who may have access to the specimens in a way that I don't have access to them and who may have access to the technologies necessary to do the kind of work that you're talking about, you know, detect whether any DNA is present and sequence it and see how it relates to the modern human DNA.